So first of all, great pleasure to, um, to be here. And uh, yeah, thanks all for, for, yeah, for, for the invitation. Um, I'll, um, uh, I wanted to, um, first of all, start with um, it, it, it's something I added while I was listening to Antoine. Um, when I was listening to him about you know, why we might want to share all of this. And actually, this, uh, this is an editorial we did just uh, recently with Richard Sennett in, in The Guardian. Um, about uh, something that we think is part of what Antoine looked at how digital can help us to create like a collective way of sensing. But there's also something interesting that goes back to Thurston Veblen. And I put this up just in case anybody's interested in, in looking at this in, in more detail. But Thurston Veblen you know, was the guy who, who coined the word conspicuous consumption. And uh, the interesting thing today is that we can be conspicuous but without traditional consumption. And I think if we manage to build on that dynamics, actually, it's quite a nice thing. In the 20th century, the only way we could be conspicuous in the Thurston and Veblen way was uh, really you know, to, to consume objects and physical things. And today we can use a lot of digital in order to share, yes, what we saw before, like you know, a dish on Instagram or something else, an experience. If we manage to do it, it could be good news because we can be, for two reasons. The first one is that you know, we can be conspicuous with less consumption, with, uh, with less consumption of physical things. Um, but the other thing is that, um, you know, when Veblen was writing, he was looking at um, how um, consumption is related to what we put into the product we consume. And now before the Industrial Revolution, there was a lot of us in those products, but that thing actually breaks down when we get to mass production and the Industrial Revolution. And I think, you know, the sharing of experiences goes back to ourselves, being able to craft somehow the experiences we want to share with others. So it says something about us, which is much more fine-tuned, the kind of the, the, the bold way that was used with objects in the, in the 20th century. But it was just a quick thought that I came to mind. I wanted to add to, to, to the beautiful presentation of Antoine. I think there's also this component in why we share so much stuff online, food and all the other things, all these experiences. I think the same process we've seen throughout history, before the Industrial Revolution, that was the things we would make, then it was things we would buy, and today is again things we make, but more in the digital than in the physical sense. Well, having said that, this was just, you know, again, a quick response to, uh, to, to a quick, uh, you know, thing that was inspired by Antoine. But uh, I want to share with you more sensing, um, and now with a different angle, more like a few examples of sensing we've been doing in cities and using digital data to understand cities. Well, why do we look at cities? Just four numbers about cities. 250, 75, and 80. City is only 2% of the crust of the planet, but a 50%, a little bit over 50% of the population, 75% of energy consumption, and 80% of, of CO2 emissions. So if we can do something to make our cities more efficient, then the impact at the global level could be, could be, could be huge. And uh, as we heard before, you know, cities are uh, becoming in the middle of this uh, convergence of physical and digital space. You could say the internet is becoming internet of things, and it's transforming many dimensions of where, where we live. So it's uh, like you know, bits and atoms coming together with, with us in the middle. I would argue that this is radically transforming architecture and design, as well as our way to understand the city and to live in, uh, in the city. Let me give one example out of many. Um, it's about uh, you know, mobile phone, mobile connection. It might be surprising today to think that uh, there was a time not that long ago, just you know, 30, 40 years ago, when humanity could live without mobile connections. And they took 20 years to get to 1 billion connections, and then it started growing from there. Today, we're almost like uh, 7 billion. You might say, you know, there's 7 billion people on the planet. How much more could this grow? Well, according to most prediction, we are somewhere here, and we'll be at 50 billion by 2020. And uh, how could this be? Uh, you know, we're not going to walk with uh, 17 iPads in, uh, in our pockets, but we started connecting people with people, and then people with data, people with machine with data, and more and more M2M, -M, machine to machine things, objects talking to, to other objects, almost as if every atom out there were becoming both a sensor and, uh, and an actuator. Now, what I want to share with you is, you know, all, the, all what this produces, and this produces an incredible amount of data, is what, oops, what happened? An incredible amount of data is what Antoine was mentioning before. Um, just got disconnected. Okay. What Antoine was mentioning before, um, uh, an incredible amount of data. And there's many ways to quantify. You know, there's a, you can find a lot of statistics such as this. If you take all the data in the world today, it has been produced in the past two years alone. Um, there's another definition that I like is by Mike Batty, a colleague and friend at University College in, in London. And Mike says, you know, big data is what you cannot put in an Excel spreadsheet. 
And I think it's actually quite a profound definition because you know, when you've got big data, such huge amount of data, we need new tools in order just to store it, to analyze it, to make sense of it, to visualize it. So big data is also what happens when beyond the traditional tools we, we are accustomed to use with, with data. So what I wanted to do today was just simply to show you a few projects related to data in the city and how they might uh, unveil different dimensions of, uh, of the city. At the lab, we were one of the first groups to look at um, uh, data produced by uh, all of us, crowdsourced data, especially picture we upload on the, on the internet, on Flickr, on other platform, on Facebook. So we're one of the first groups to look at this. And the interesting thing you can do when you look at, uh, at all these pictures, you can first look at you know, where are the hotspots in a city. That's a project we did in Florence. You can look at uh, all Tuscany, and then you see Florence, the bright spot. You zoom in, you see, you know, you can go inside the city and see the most photographed places. And then you can also go all the way in at the level of uh, the scale of the, the single building. Then if you do some, something slightly more sophisticated, you just look at the header of the picture and you look at the time when the picture was taken, then you can build trajectories. What you see here, for instance, is Italians and Americans as they move in Tuscany. Now, I've got a question for you. Where are the Americans? To the left or to the right? Make up your mind. Then you need to, to, to raise your hand, either or. So, Americans to the left, raise your hands. Okay. Americans to the right, raise your hands. Almost like 50-50. Americans are to the left here. And they're to the left here. And you see, if you're American, you go to Italy maybe once every 10 years, once in a lifetime. And you do this kind of almost like an elephant's path. You know, you go to Genoa, to Pisa, to Florence, to Siena, to Perugia. If you're Italian, you've been there many times since, uh, you know, elementary school. You've been going to Florence and so on. So you look at totally different the way you go and look, and look at little, pe little pieces in, uh, in Tuscany where, you know, people might live, little villages. Look at an island called Island of Elba. No Americans there, virtually on, on, on Facebook, but a lot of Italians and, and Germans and, and other nationalities. So the idea that, uh, you know, you can use this as a way to, to understand uh, the city, that's actually the project Antoine showed briefly before. We called it the world's eyes, Los Ojos del Mundo. It was a design museum in Barcelona. There's something our students were really excited about was, you know, can you actually look at, look, use artificial intelligence and all the pictures that are uploaded in order to see, to spot the best place to go partying in Barcelona. And you can look at them in real time, you analyze them, and you try to understand what is going on in the city. They even managed to get a scientific paper accepted where they found out, they discovered a very surprising correlation between Britons and parties in, uh, in, the, um, in the Catalan capital. Um, you can also look at other type of uh, intelligence. You can look at the pictures. In this case, you know, a big issue in Spain is uh, look at um, drought. You know, drought uh, during the summer actually moves through, through the country. The country gets drier and drier. And the way you monitor drought today is using a lot of sensors. But here you can actually use all the data from pictures and uh, uh, kind of, again, appropriate the eyes we all have, we, we use every day, the picture we all, we all take every day, look at that in order to monitor in an in approximate way drought and how it changes over, over the country. Again, you know, a lot of data, not very precise, however, it gives a good sense of what is going on. Um, today I was asked to present also a project that's still ongoing. Uh, this first paper, uh, I, I put some references to the papers. I'll try to be less technical today, but um, uh, that's, uh, that's coming out now. But um, uh, where actually we looked at all the Google Street View images. As you know, Google Street View runs through most of the cities across the, the planet and takes pictures, footage of all the cities. And so what we've been doing is look at that and again use uh, both the simple um, image processing but also now more and more deep learning uh, AI in order to understand better the city. And for instance, one of the things uh, we can do, this is a project we call Treepedia. We looked, decided to look at this to do the global map of trees all across the world. So what you see, you take all this footage taken by, by Google. Um, you know, you basically, those are the things. You just, you know, put it in the standard format. The first thing, you look at all the streets. You select all the streets, which is this kind of sampling. Um, then you collect all the Google Street View images, which is what you do here. There's an API by Google that allows you to do it. And then you start looking at them. Uh, you know, but it's quite a lot of images. Uh, if, if you think about uh, in a city, you, got, uh, you can have half a million images. And in London, UK, there's, uh, we had to process more, something like or the order of one million images, quite a lot. Again, you know, the first thing you can do is, uh, is just use uh, image processing. You can be more sophisticated with convoluted neural networks. Um, but here you see, you know, you just get, uh, get the image and uh, you analyze it. And in this case, you get the mask which tells you about the trees. Again, with deep learning, we, we hope to be able to tell the type of tree. You got some issues because uh, the pictures are taken in, in different times of the year. 
But the good thing is that with Google, you can look at uh, actually pictures taken you know, recently over the summer or during the winter. So actually, you might want to go back in time, because if you, if you just take you know, one snapshot, then it's difficult to understand better what is going on. But if you know the different images taken over time, you also know when different trees, uh, when, when the leaves fall, when there's foliage for different tree types. And then you, you better understand what is going on there. And, and with that, we've, um, we've created this, um, this kind of global map. Um, we are adding cities, uh, and we are actually planning to open it up so that anybody can contribute, anybody can run the code. Uh, that allows you really to explore this. Now, we were quite surprised by something that was in our mind when we did it. was, you know, well, if you give this to citizens, would it encourage uh, some action? And, and we're very surprised by the fact that actually we've been flooded by, literally by email, by thousands of emails of people who said, you know, hey, can you tell me more about my neighborhood? Uh, what could I do? Can, uh, people who say, you know, well, I'm organizing a campaign to go to the mayor and say, can you make my city greener uh, versus another city, and so on. So I thought, you know, I'll, I'll, uh, this, has, um, as this project is still ongoing. Uh, I put some, some links to what Antoine was saying, especially when the census, what we collect, can be collected in this case in a cold way with the three view, but then you give it to citizens, which is our next step, like this, so that people can annotate it. And you create this kind of digital map overlay of the physical space that can help us to better understand our cities and hopefully to use that information to change it or to ask the government to, to take action. Um, there's many other things we can do with digital data. That's a project I, it's a very old project, but I thought, I thought I'd show it here um, because there's a strong reference to France. It's a very old project. It's one of the first ones we did. It was 2006. This was the Venice Biennale. We had a pavilion there. Um, so now 11 years ago. One of the first projects we ever did at the lab. And, um, and here for the first time ever, we actually uh, collected data, anonymized data from millions of people in the city to really get the pulse of the city in real time what is going on. Some of the work that, uh, that was done then is actually still used today. Some of the papers and patents that came out of the work is still what is used today to look at uh, traffic in cities in real time. You know, when you get the data from, from Google in order to tell you there's a jam in a, in, on a road, you know, that is done with this type of, anal this type of analysis. This was the first time it was, it was done. Um, and, um, and you see here, you see, the, you see the city, Rome. We would get all the data in real time, especially cell phone data from millions of people. We'll send it to servers. We set up at MIT. We'll analyze it in real time, again, simple data analytics and visualization, and then we'll, we'll ship it back to the Venice Biennale with the idea to close the loop, to actually you know, show this real-time information. Some of this is one of the more planning-oriented papers in, in environment and planning. Now, that, um, this summer, actually, something quite interesting happened. And that's why I mentioned France, is that you know, that summer, Italy and France were playing the final for the Soccer World Cup. And, uh, well, Italy won. Um, and um, look at what happened that night in the city of Rome um, while people were watching the final. So this is the city of Rome, the day of the final. Italy and France were playing in Germany. This is before the match, people moving here and there in the city. You see the Colosseum, you see the river. That's the afternoon. Again, people moving through the city. Evening, in a moment, the match begins, silence. Nobody talks. France scores, Italy scores. Half time, people make a call and go to the bathroom. And then uh, second half, end of normal time, first overtime, second overtime, a famous headbutt by Zidane in a moment. And finally, Italy wins. Ole. <laughs> And then uh, that night, everybody goes to celebrate here. Um, then the following day, again, you know, the winning team from, um, from Germany went to Italy to meet the prime minister, and everybody went to celebrate in the city center. By the end of the day, actually, everybody went to this place you see here uh, called Circo Massimo. It's a place where Romans go to celebrate since, uh, since Roman times. And, uh, and you see a big peak by the, the end of the afternoon. So the idea that we can actually understand things of the city we couldn't before. Um, this is another type of data sets we, we can collect from cities. Very simple, is data from taxis. Uh, this data from taxis in New York, what you see here is JFK Airport. And incidentally, this data set was, uh, was made accessible by Mayor Bloomberg. You know, Mayor Bloomberg built a whole career uh, on data. Uh, his whole company, you know, really what it does, it makes data more accessible. So he's obsessed with data. When you, when you go, went to see him in, in his New York office when he was mayor of New York, he had a little sign on the wall they said, um, in God we trust, everybody else bring data. And then one of the things he did was actually make a lot of the city data accessible to people and accessible to researchers. So we got this data, we had to write to the taxi and limousine commission, we got the data, you see here JFK Airport, 
every dot, pick up and the drop off by taxi. You zoom out, JFK was here, and then here's Manhattan, here are all the boroughs. And then we, we started asking, our, asking ourselves, you know, these days we like to share many things. We like to share apartments on Airbnb, couches on couch surfing platforms. So what about sharing mobility? Now the potential seems to be there. If you look at those two points, you've got hundreds of thousands of trips connecting those two points in the course of the year. So how many of those could be shared? Again, you know, when you've got big data, sometimes you need new tools. Um, sometimes we say, you know, big data needs big math or new math in order to analyze it. What we did here was actually use network science to, to address the shareability of the net data. We developed something we call shareability networks. Just if you use traditional ways such as linear programming, the, those systems fail because the share amount of, uh, of data. What you see here is a kind of shareability networks that densify. What you say is imagine you want to take, mathematically you say, imagine you want to take everybody to destination exactly when they need to be there. Give or take a small delta. Imagine one, two, or three minutes. You can change the delta. And actually what you see here is, that is uh, you change the delta, the, how the different uh, networks densify. And uh, then what is the minimum number of vehicles you need to, to do that? And it's quite extraordinary that when you run it in New York, um, what you find is that uh, you could actually cut 40% of the vehicles and still satisfy the mobility demand of, uh, of the whole city. So, you know, there's a lot of redundancy. If people were ready to share, you could do this. Um, two interesting things happened after this. Uh, the paper from, from is a recent paper, but um, the first results came out earlier. And the results came to the attention of Uber. And since then, we started a collaboration with Uber. Uh, and as you might know, Uber Pool does exactly this. Actually allows um, uh, trips to be shared in an effective way. And Uber Pool has been a big success you know, in all cities, including Paris. Um, the second thing that's interesting, when this came out, the, the New York Times did a review and said, um, and wrote, you know, this is interesting mathematics and interesting, interesting piece of research, but you know what? No New Yorker would ever want to share anything else with any other New Yorker, let alone a car. Well, it turns out that's not the case, and uh, now that we have the Uber data, we, we can certify, we can see that actually Uber's, Uber, Uber Pool has been a big success in San Francisco, over 50% of all trips every day happened by, by Uber pool, and in many other cities, which means basically when you combine two trips, you remove one car from the street, which means less congestion, less energy consumption, less pollution, and ultimately also a better service for the people who, who share the trip. I'll tell you next time about the next project our students want to do, which is combining Uber pool in Tinder and Grindr, but that's a, a different conversation. <laughs> Um, so, um, you might say, okay, uh, we, this is a recent uh, piece of research, also we looked at uh, uh, how this uh, can apply to different cities, so we find a kind of scaling law of urban ride sharing, a generalized law uh, that you see here, so actually all cities around the world behave in a similar way. When you look at all this empirical data from, uh, from, you know, from billions of trips from all over the world, you analyze it, you find these this things. Um, I also want to share with you something still related to mobility, you know, this is about sharing the sharing the, the ride. But also tomorrow we'll be able to share the car in a better way because of self-driving. Self-driving is now a reality. Our cars today, it's a piece of a research uh, we're doing with uh, Audi Volkswagen. Um, it, in the average car today has thousands of uh, sensors on it. It's what you see here. And uh, so you know everything about it actually. You can use the car as a beautiful sensing platform for the city because all these sensors tell you a lot about the environment, about the car itself, and about the driver. But then, you know, more and more people are adding two more sensors, a few cameras or these two little things, two little ears, they are some LiDAR sensors. And what they do is simply do a three-dimensional scan of the city, like this. Now you take this, which is pretty much what the, how the human eye sees the city in 3D, you feed it into an eye system and then you get a self-driving car. And again, this is not the distant future, this is the present, more or less. You know, in order to make it fully, there's still a few issues when we sell driving cars, when you got a lot of rain, uh, when uh, you know, there's a lot of snow. In the same way as we have issues to drive when there's a lot of rain, when there's a fog as humans. So I think you know, the, the technology uh, is uh, it's really, it's really there. There's uh, uh, thousands of cars being tested as we speak in cities around the world. We've actually been involved with, uh, with the government of Singapore uh, in order to do the first large-scale deployment of self-driving cars right now in Singapore where people can jump on a car. There's many companies testing them. There's different parts of the island where you, you can try and jump on a, on a self-driving car. Well, when this happens, everything is going to change again because um, the car drives itself. 
And it can give you a lift in the morning when you go to the office and then can give a lift to somebody else in your family or to anybody else in the city. So you're creating a hybrid system in between public and, uh, in pub pub public and private uh, transportation. Now, if you combine this with what we were saying before, now this is the sharing of the car over time, with what we were saying before about you know, the sharing of the ride, the combination of the two means a city where you could actually satisfy the mobility demand of uh, you know, Paris or London or uh, New York, Singapore or Lyon, a big city or a smaller city, with uh, just a very small fraction of the cars we have today. I'm not saying that this is going to happen. There's also, you know, there's also other things can happen. We can also end up with more cars, but theoretically, we can create more efficient systems. A few years from now, when, when everything will be self-driving, other things might change, such as this. We're all familiar with this. It's a well-known traffic light. And traffic lights appear on our streets when cars appear on our streets. But then if you've got an intelligent system where every car knows where it is and knows where all the other cars are, you don't need to stop anymore. You can keep on going, just avoiding collisions like this. Don't try it yet. I gave a presentation in Naples and they told me, so what is new here? <laughs> I, I, I'm Italian so I can, say, I can say this, you know, this is from an Italian, former Italian minister saying in Milan, traffic lights and instructions. In Rome, there are suggestions. In Naples, there are Christmas decorations. <laughs> If you're, interested in the math, in, if you're interested in the mathematics, actually, there's a, this is one of the papers where we looked at, uh, at this. Actually, the first author is a, is a French guy from uh, Rue Dume, uh, who's, uh, who has been with us for a few years at, uh, at MIT. But it's quite interesting how you, even an intersection that's uh, uh, quite uh, simple, when you look at it, then has so many trajectories, so many frequencies of arrival. So mathematically, it becomes quite a nice problem to look at. And, and here you see you know, some of the... Um, some of the analysis we've been doing this is a real intersection in Singapore. Um, what you see to the left and to the right is the same number of cars arriving, but to the left managed using the most sophisticated traffic light system we have today, and to the right using a, a slot-based intersection, using slots similar to what you have with uh, airports. Look at the difference between the left and the right in terms of cars waiting and uh, delay per car, just the same amount of cars, but just changing the way you, you manage this. The interesting thing is that usually an intersection is the key bottleneck, because you've got two flows of cars competing for the same real estate. And um, so if you saw the intersection, they can trickle down across the whole, the whole city. Now, um, the, um, the final thing I want to share with you again about data is uh, sometimes you really want to develop and deploy sensors. What you saw before was about data we can collect by using, by analyzing all the images or the information we upload. Uh, you can call it crowdsourced data. Then the second type of data you saw was uh, what is often called opportunistic data. It's the data which is produced for whatever reason, for running the cell phone network, and then you appropriate it and try to use it to understand something else about, for instance, mobility in the city. But then sometimes you really want to get out and, uh, and put sensors in, uh, in, uh, in the environment to understand what's going on in the city. And uh, today sensors are becoming cheaper and cheaper. Uh, you know, it's very easy to deployment. Um, and so I want to share with you this project. You know, this project is about sensors and, and uh, waste. If you can put sensor, sensors on garbage, you can really put sensors anywhere you want. Um, in this case, we started from this problem that is um, related to this computer you see here on the table. Today, you know everything about this computer. Every chip in this computer, you know where it was produced, how it moved on the planet, how it became this machine. But uh, then, a um, few years from now, you stop using this machine, you sell it. At some point, somebody will throw it away. And then you know nothing about it. Sometimes, this is what happens. A lot of e-waste being shipped illegally to Africa from Europe, to, from the United States to Asia. So our idea was, you know, well, what if you could actually put a little chip on waste and start following waste? So we understand what goes to the right place, to the wrong place. We better understand not the supply chain, but the removal chain. Today we know everything about the supply chain that's been optimized over the past few decades. We know very little about what happens when we throw things away. Again, that's a reference to the paper if anybody's interested, one of the papers if anybody is interested. They're all available free on our website, uh, free access on our, on our website. And um, so we did this. We, 
We had to design this little tag to do this, uh, like a miniature cell phone. This was the first deployment we did in the city of Seattle. 500 people came, 3,000 pieces of trash. We put a little tag on all of them. And after tagging all of them, um, we started following them. So here you see the daily deployment in Seattle. 3,000 objects. After a few days, you see some of the main landfills next to Seattle. But a big surprise, how far stuff started to travel. Sometimes in crazy, unpredictable ways. Look at those traces that you look at the trace that went all the way to Chicago, changed its mind, and went back to California. Is it moving after one month or two months? So the Firewall Symphony was, was the right piece of music. So what you can do with this, first you, learn, you get a lot of data about the removal chain and you can then optimize it, try to use this information to make it more efficient. If you look at some of the papers, there's a huge amount of energy wasted by moving all this stuff around in, in this way. The second thing that's interesting is that data per se can actually produce very interesting behavioral change. We're sharing the data with people. And then uh, there's, again, a paper we went and asked people, you know, uh, you know, did this have an impact on consumption, on the way, you know, you recycle? And it turns out that um, it seems to have a big impact. One of the anecdotes, most anecdotes I like most, is somebody who came to us and said, look, I used to drink water in plastic bottles every day, and then throw away the bottles and forget about them. But now, after the project, I know that those bottles go to a landfill a few miles from home. They will stay there forever. So stop drinking water in, in plastic bottles. Now, the third thing we discover is that uh, a lot of things actually go to the edge of the United States, and then we couldn't trace them anymore. We're using these kind of tags we designed, like miniature cell phones, that only were able to trace things inside the United States. So um, what we um, have been doing over the past three years is do a follow-up uh, of the project where we actually try to do the, the first global uh, e-waste uh, tracking project. Um, we found places such as this one in the middle of the jungle in, uh, in Asia, uh, if you go on our website, you'll find this. You can look at each of the traces. Um, this was the largest ever just e-waste focus uh, project. Um, if you're interested in looking at some of those places also where this ends up, there's a special by PBS uh, from some months ago, uh, the national TV channel in the United States who follows some of the traces. But the idea that basically this information, big data, if we share it, if we understand it and share it, can actually help us tackle some of the global issues. In this case, we get better understand what's going on on the planet and then, based on this information, we can hopefully fix it or, or take action. And the final thing I want to share with you is something that was totally unexpected. It happened to us while we were doing the project. And then well, that's when um, a burglar came to our offices at MIT. And this poor guy stole a lot of things, including tags and computers that tell you where they go. And this is what happened. Thank you.
Thank you, Carlo, very much. Um, questions? Down there. Thank you, Carlo. Uh, you showed us a really beautiful uh, uh, vision of the future where all connected cars actually eradicate uh, 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 problems in the intersections. Well, uh, that works when all of the cars are actually connected. What happens if, uh, if one of them actually gets offline? Or even more importantly, how do you actually uh, uh, integrate pedestrians into these schemes? Look, I mean, we, we don't care about pedestrians because anyway, we're all going to be replaced by artificial intelligence. So, you know, no need to, no need to, no. So, I'll, uh, I'll, uh, I'll uh, no, actually, there's, there's a section about pedestrians in this. It's for, I will start from the second part. You know, for pedestrians, you do it like you do today. Actually, pedestrians also have slots when you cross a, an intersection because you got, in that case, you know, your slot assigned to cross it. So, you can g easily integrate it in. That is not, uh, is not an issue. Um, I think your other point is, I think more general is very, very important. It is the point about, you know, about safety, about hacking. And, you know, hacking, first of all, hacking is as old as the beginning of um, telecommunications. You know, Marconi, who invented wireless transmissions, you know, when he was giving a demonstration in London of wireless transmissions, wireless transmission, the first time he was giving, I believe, at the Royal Society, he was hacked. Uh, there was one of the people who didn't, didn't like one of his patents, was fighting with him with one of the patents. Um, and this guy actually started sending uh, obscene messages instead of uh, Marconi's messages, you know, to this kind of scandalized audience of the, the Royal Society. So it was kind of one of the, the first examples of hacking in this space. And over the past, uh, over 100 years since Marconi's experiments, we've seen plenty of, um, of similar things. And we know it, you know, all of us have been probably gotten a virus at least once on a computer, have been hacked and so on. And, and I think that's a very big issue. It's something where we really need to, um, uh, to work a lot. Because what we are doing, we're creating cyber-physical systems. Cities are just one example of cyber-physical systems. But you know, nuclear power plants are cyber-physical systems. Uh, our cars are becoming cyber-physical systems, and so on and so forth. And so in cyber-physical systems, cyber systems um, have, um, have an issue that if somebody hacks into the digital side, into the cyber side, then can actually produce a lot of damage in the, the physical one. And I think we've seen already examples. If you look at the, you know, some of you might recall, it was already some years ago, I think it was 2011, uh, Stuxnet was uh, something that was used supposedly, or that's what, uh, what you know, the media said, by the US and the Israeli Secret Service in order to sabotage the Iranian uh, nuclear program by using a kind of a computer virus that would actually destroy uh, the, the centrifuge that were enriched uh, uranium. Uh, so I think you know, this was one example. Nobody was hurt there. It was done you know, more for, in, in order to, to damage a, and, and destroy a, a program of another country. But similar things could happen tomorrow in our cities. So I think, that's, I think that's one of the most important things. My impression is that what we need to do is start to create the systems. I mean, the last thing you want to do is run your city with a system that's like an urban operating system, a little bit like you know, your Windows uh, operating system for, for your city. I mean, that's the last thing you want to do, because as we know, that's uh, something that's very fragile and something where if somebody enters in it, then it, it could have devastating impact. If you look at what happens with nature, usually you see a different type of architecture. In architecture, where you've got many people looking, overlooking other people, a lot of redundancy. Think about the army, even the army in, from the point of view of, uh, of humans can be hacked by somebody infiltrating the army. But you know, there's a number of uh, controls where people, you know, there, there's a lot of number of redundancy and controls that avoid that, that that happens easily. And so I think that to me seems to be a very interesting topic to, to look at what are the new type of uh, architectures, architectures from the point of view of uh, computer architecture that we need to put in place to avoid such scenarios. And, uh, and I think, you know, it's about our cities but it's about most of the things now in our lives. You know, everything is becoming a cyber-physical system. Your washing machine uh, is going to have very soon more computing power than uh, you know, NASA had to, for the Apollo mission. I mean, there's already more computing power than the Apollo mission in our pockets. And, um, and then when that happens, we need to see what type of digital architecture we can create. And I see this, again, as a convergence between biological and, and digital systems, where probably digital system of tomorrow will be very different than the ones we are we know about, it will be much more similar to the biological systems we, we, we know. Yeah. Yes. <clears throat> Hi. Peter O'Brien. I teach here at Versailles. Thank you for your talk. Um, very interesting. I was struck by sort of two different categories of what we saw 
um, one in which uh, a kind of ecological positive outcome is really evident in terms of uh, ride sharing and the way the traffic systems could work to, I'm sure, reduce uh, carbon footprint of cars going through an intersection. But I was sort of saddened by another aspect wherein somebody needs to be shown a high-end graphic image produced by data mining um, in order to understand that using a plastic bottle and throwing it away is an ecological problem. So that's in a totally other category where this kind of technology is being used um, admittedly in a positive way, but it, it makes me sad about that person who needed in order to, do, to realize how, how bad his quote-unquote ecological behavior was by you know, throwing away all those plastic water bottles. And I was wondering if, if, if in your work there aren't uh, some thoughts or considerations on, on those two different categories. Um, yeah, no, thanks, uh, th thanks a lot for asking this. Um, I think, and I think, you know, I, I thought I'll also, because we are in, a, in an architecture school, I'll, uh, I thought I'll, maybe I'll, I'll show this, um, this image, more to say about the role of what, you know, both we try to do, but also I think how the role of uh, designers, architects, engineering is, engineers is changing today. And you know, I want to start with this, that's a very famous hand, is the hand of Le Corbusier presenting his ideas for Paris. I think, if I'm not wrong, it was 1923. It was at the Pavillon de l'Esprit Nouveau, Pavillon of the New Spirit. And his idea for Paris were, were quite simple, basically, were basically demolish the whole city, uh, just leave Notre Dame and a couple of other little quaint uh, uh, souvenirs from the past, and just replace everything with, uh, with these uh, beautiful skyscrapers. But when you look at Le Corbusier's hand here, you know, it's uh, the hand of Le Corbusier, the hand of the architect, almost like the hand of God, making decisions for millions of people without even bothering to, to ask them. You know, that was, you know, the plan for the plan was I, and, you know, it was just, you know, to be implemented. And um, if you look at this, this is actually how architecture and planning and, and engineering has been seen a lot in the past century. You know, there was the idea that, you know, there was the right solution. You could prove it. In, in engineering, you could prove it mathematically or somehow. You know, you just had to impose it, to deploy it. You know, who cares? what people thought. Well, I know we know that, that this produced a number of uh, disasters. Um, and uh, by the way, too bad Antoine left because he's the, the chairman of the Fondation Le Corbusier, so it probably we would have had a lively debate with, uh, with him. Um, but uh, but um, the, the, if you look at this, you know, that's, uh, that's um, uh, the 20th century way produced uh, huge disasters. And we, we see it still in many of the neighborhoods that were built using this kind of principle in some of the cities. If you go to Brasilia, it's a beautiful city when you land with your plane. It actually, the city looks like a plane with open wings. When you're there, it's perfect, just it forgot one ingredient that was people. Uh, and so, you know, there's no sidewalks, there's no way to walk and so on. So, but this was kind of a top-down approach to this. Now, what could be a different way to do it? Well, I think the different way to do it, if you look more at, uh, again, a nature. And if you look at natural evolution, so I think ultimately what we are all dealing with in this room is what Herbert Simon, the great Nobel Prize winner and you know, researcher and, uh, and sociologist and economist, uh, would have called this the artificial. He wrote a beautiful book called The Science of the Artificial. If you look at the artificial, then the artificial, the way it changes uh, is uh, not that different than the way the natural world changes, it's through mutations. You, know, you get the mutation, the mutation replicate. You can think about the iPhone as one of these mutations. So somehow I think that our role should not be the one to take, like, think about the future and try to impose it on, or explore it and try to make it, impose it like the vision of architecture in the past century. But I think it's something different. It's almost to start a, to show different potentials and show how those could affect our cities, but then use it to start a conversation knowing that ultimately the decision will be in the hands of, of all of us, of citizens. So it's a very different approach to what design is. Is, you know, is design looking at how the world could be. Herbert Simon in the book, he says, you know, science looks at how the world is, design looks at how the world could be. And, you know, I think, you know, that's, I believe, is, is our role. Now, if we do this, sometimes we also want to show a, a dystopian scenario. Because when you show a dystopian scenario, it could be a good way to create antibodies, to avoid going there. Uh, it, becomes, uh, it becomes, you know, something similar to white hat hacking. Basically, you're looking at vulnerability of, uh, of our society, you show it, and then, you know, perhaps, hopefully, that can help us to, to avoid it. So I see, you know, going back to your question, I think, you know, we think that our role, uh, or we tr what we try to do, uh, but we see this more as the broader role for everybody dealing with artificial, that's 
architects, planners, engineers, designers, you name it, everybody dealing with this beautiful world we are creating outside ourselves, is uh, not really to try to say, okay, this is the solution, we're just going to impose it with our hands like this. It's more about you know, trying out different things, showing different mutations, being like mutagens, and, uh, and, and then letting the system respond. And in doing that, you know, sometimes we want to follow what we like and show a future we like. Sometimes we also want to show a future we don't like, because perhaps the only way not to go there is to show it. Thank you. I saw another hand. Uh, yes. Oh, here. I, I was just going to follow up that. I, the, 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 uh, the, the interchange, interchange image of, of the cars, um, it, it, it struck me because there's a film at the, at the British Film Institute in 1904 and of bank station or bank interchange. And, it's, and, and what's amazing about it is firstly the buildings are still the same, so it feels very familiar. Yeah. But literally the, the, you have cars, horses, buses, people jumping off buses mid-flow, but the flow through that is completely kind of self-organizing and choreographed, and actually the through flow is, is kind of far more vehicles or, or, or horses that, than you do with the traffic light system. So it's, but, and, and I guess the other thing is, we, you know, in terms of fostering partners, they've just designed a, uh, a new Apple headquarters, and they've used the most advanced uh, c computer fluid tech, you know, s simulation of airflow to prove to Apple that natural ventilation is you know a, a good way to go and so it's kind of it seems insane that we're using these kind of the most extreme technologies to prove that actually the air outside is you know you don't need to use mechanical ventilation systems and it seems to me that there's a kind of recurrence of that in in these kind of smart cars to prove you don't need traffic lights when actually we had that successfully a hundred years ago well, I'll, uh, I will respond. We are, uh, we are uh, <clears throat> now in France, and uh, I'll, I'll just dig it out. Uh, there's a beautiful sentence by, by Paul Valéry, um, who said, in, in modern life, what I like most, and what I ask technologies, is allow me to live an old life in a more comfortable way. And I think, you know, some, sometimes, you know, what we're trying to do is just do the old things we always wanted to do, but be able to do them again. And, you know, I think many of the projects we, we've been doing, I mean, think about Facebook. What does it, it does what we've done for thousands of years. We were doing that, you know, next to the well, the village well, and go there and gossip and say, hey, you know, Jay and I, Jay and I, Jane and I split and, you know, and gossip uh, 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 regarding each other. And then, you know, we would, would do this in the 100, 200 years ago, writing letters to each other, and uh, then we would do this. It was very, very annoying in the 20th century. People had, you know, if you split with somebody, you had to call 20 people to let them know. And now you just, you know, post it and, you know, it's, uh, it's done. So it's, a, it's doing the same thing we've always done, but just in a different way. So I think a lot of technologies really ab are about that. And uh, it's, uh, it's not what, what is behind is quite stable and permanent. It's, about, it's very human. If you look at you know, the way genetics change is, uh, is much slower than technology. So yes, you, know, you have a lot of this where just technology, you really do the, the old things just in a, in a different way. And um, I'll, uh, I'll actually, I didn't show it today. I'll show you briefly just a project we are doing in Amsterdam, which is... Um, um, which is uh, uh, going on right now, and uh, <clears throat> I'll show you very briefly, uh, which is again doing something that's always been done, but uh, doing it in a, uh, do, doing, allowing us to do some things we've always done, but in a, in a different way. Um, in this case, you know, we are working on, uh, you mentioned uh, driving and uh, intersection, we're working on self-driving cars in, uh, in Amst self-driving boats in Amsterdam, so um, I'll show you briefly just because again, it could be. So, you know, it's the Amsterdam, it's, um, it's an amazing city, but, you know, there's more water than roads in the center. And uh, we started thinking with the mayor about new technology and new mobility. You know, and then, um, and then you know, you can't do much with self-driving cars, but, you know, well, what you can do is uh, self-driving boats. So we call them bro boats. Um, and what you can do with that? Well, you can move people around, like people have done for a long time. You can move goods around. This is a DHL. These are people, people mover. You can scan the city. But then you can also use this as pixels, actually, to, to create like a temporary bridge or a temporary floating platform. Uh, we just started nine months ago. We have the first prototypes now. But you know, that's nothing else than what we've done for a long time. That's, for instance, Venice, out of many cities. You can think about Bangkok as well, creating temporary bridges by combining, in this case, floating gondolas. But no, I think the beauty of technology is when it allows us to do sometimes the things we've done before, we've always wanted to do, but in a, in a, in a different way. So, so I think there's many projects that we do that actually think about uh, about the task so anyway yes hi um just a quick question um 
Do you think we kind of run the risk of a bit like Corbusier, but we're kind of, you talk about inclusivity and everything, but we're, we're, there's some generations we're kind of forgetting with this technology. Right? So, you know, the, uh, not to generalize, but an older generation and a lot of people I know won't have such these devices even in today's world. And, and that kind of sets up a tension between the younger generation and us here, like in 30 years' time, we'll be behind. Yeah. I, I think, I mean, you know, we, we always need to be careful about divides. And, you know, and, uh, and also there's something interesting that, you know, every technology always starts at the cutting edge. If you think about, you know, these things in our pockets, as, just as mobile phones, well, the first mobile phones a few decades ago, they were very clunky, they were super expensive, just a few people had them. So actually the mobile phone was an instrument that would in increase the divide between the have and the have-nots. But then if you fast forward 20, 30 years, you see, the mobile phones have become an incredible tool for doing the opposite. You know, for, for well, you, you see, like, you know, Africa where uh, mobile phones enable people to do banking and mobile banking are much more sophisticated than the U.S. or Europe. Um, I saw a fisherman in Sri Lanka who, thanks to mobile phone, now they're able to get in real time the price of fish and not to be ripped off, ripped off by, you know, the... Uh, the, the, the local uh, uh, dealers who would actually buy, who would buy the fish and then before, before they have access to this information would try to... Yeah, yeah. So, so I think you see a very interesting example of this kind of leapfrogging and closing the gap. So I think every technology at the beginning, by definition, just if people have it, increases the gap. And then, uh, uh, and then if you plan it right, however, it can have a much better effect on a broader scale to close the gap. I think and it's a software, you know, where to find the information rather than the hardware. Um, that's, that's where there'll be a, anyway. <laughs> yeah, I think there's a, 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 yeah, but what I'm saying, I'm talking about technology in general, you know, the hardware and, yeah, and the software sure. is still, even the software, you know, the access to data. Um, again, you know, as I said, you know, when we did the project in Rome about real-time Rome, you know, nobody has access to real-time cell phone data. Now, all of us in this room, you just open Google and you get <laughs> cell phone data telling you where the, the, the traffic jam is. So I think, you know, they, both data and technology has this effect at the beginning. Is a increases the divide. If you plan it right, the same can, can close it. Now, that's not sure because technology is not positive or negative. We naturally, there's also technologies that will keep on increasing the divide, and we, that's where we need to be careful. Yeah. But that's why I think the only way we can play with it is actually to, to be mutagens, to produce more variation and mutations so the society can ultimately decide what we want to adopt and what we don't want to adopt. So I think you know, that's what the thing, I see our role uh, can be today, which is different than the 20th century role. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Hey, thanks for the presentation. Um, I think you've been very clear about your kind of normative stance on this. Um, I just wanted to ask you about another MIT project, the Moral Machines Project, where they're trying to crowdsource what a self-driving car under poor conditions like brake failure would do when it has to make decisions about what damage to do. And as somebody who's very worried about, um, say, the social graph being coupled with a self-driving car, um, <coughs> I, I kind of wonder what your stance is on when does, when does having too much data sort of not fit our legal structures? And does it cause you any personal anxiety? I mean, I'm, yeah, I, don't, I, I would I, rather not Facebook and Uber team up to check to see who they should hit when the brakes fail on a self-driving car. Yeah. Um, do you, do well, you get worried? I guess is my question. Yeah, uh, I think it's a very interesting problem. It's a problem actually, it's a famous problem in philosophy which is called the trolley problem. And some of you may know the trolley problem, you know, the trolley problem. A anyway, but before that, let me say something, something more general, and then we'll get to the trolley problem. Uh, the more general thing is that um, if you look at uh, ethics, so if you look at, you know, about what is right, what is not right, it usually cannot be just sorted out with an algorithm. You know, if it were possible to sort it out with an algorithm, we wouldn't have lawyers, we wouldn't have, you know, judges. Uh, you know, if morality were something as simple as Boolean, black and white, zero and one, you could actually sort it out with an algorithm then you know the world would be different. It would, wouldn't need a lot of the complexity we actually have, the complexity, the complexity of interpre interpreting the real world. Now, unfortunately, when you put artificial intelligence, what happens is that you need to make a decision like that. About, you know, zero, zero, one, you know, you kill one person, another person, you need to have a very simple algorithm in order to decide, you know, what the self-driving car is going to do. Um, and um, so the problem is the old problem. The trolley problem is, uh, very briefly, there's a beautiful lecture by a colleague at from, from Harvard, actually, a TED talk about, on, uh, on, on the trolley problem. But it's very simple. Is, uh, you know, if you've got a trolley going down and you know that the trolley is going down, can hit a person if it keeps on going. Actually, it can kill, if it keeps on going, it can kill two people. Uh, but actually, you are the operator. You can actually turn a, uh, a lever. 
and then you can actually uh, put the trolley on a different track, in which case it's going to kill only one person. And the question is what do you do? And you know, some people say if you're a utilitarian, if you, are, if you follow Bentham, then if you're a utilitarian, you try to make the, the greater good, and then you say, okay, um, I'm going to do it. Because then instead of killing two people, it will kill one person. But if you think that, you know, morally think that it is unacceptable for you to ever kill, then, uh, then you will let it go. Because then you have no responsibility. The war did what it had to do, but you know, at least you haven't killed one person. Even if you could save, you could swap it. And then it becomes much more difficult, you know, if you have, you know, what if, uh, you know, the, is it uh, two younger people and an old person? Is it, you know, it, the thing can become quite difficult when you, when you look at that. And the trolley problem, actually, this theoretically is called, uh, is called the trolley problem, but actually there, there's real cases that were discussed in court. One of the most famous ones was in the 19th century in, in, in the UK, uh, where actually something similar happened. And, you know, it was debated at, at length. And that shows, you know, different ways you can approach the same problem and the fact that you cannot really easily tell how you should behave in one case or another case. And, um, and I think, you know, the difficulty with uh, self-driving cars is that actually you need to, to program them in a very simple way, in a way that, you know, they need to know what to do with them. Now, I think what is funny about the, the project you mentioned is that um, after some of the results came out and the discussion was about self-driving cars and so on, Mercedes issue, issued a statement saying, oh, you know, our self-driving, because one of the options as well is, you know, if you need to, if you're running over the crowd, well, you could also, also kill the, the person in the car and bump into a wall. I mean, that, that if, you, if you think about in a ben, following Bentham and utility, maximizing, you know, utility for the greater number of people, the greatest good for the greatest number of people, then, you know, you might want actually to kill the people on the car. And it was quite funny that actually Mercedes issued a statement saying, oh, don't worry, you know, our cars, our self-driving systems will never kill the person on the car. And I think this shows a lot of the conflicts we will see tomorrow. So no easy solution, I think. Again, it's probably part of this biological, digital integration we need to, we need to sort out. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> you talked about the danger of, uh, like, having a big, uh, huge operating system for just one city. Yeah which uh, I would totally agree with. And you also used a lot of biological metaphors to, to talk about uh, everything we, we had uh, mentioned today. And I think there is a, a growing fashion of um, seeing the whole humanity as a big living organism, which I find quite frightening in a way that it's, uh, it resembles this big operating system that would uh, try to drive a city. And I wanted to know how you feel about that. Um, thanks for mentioning. Well, well uh, my biological metaphors, you know, there's a lot of biological metaphors in, um, in, in, in when, when you look at the artificial world. Uh, there's a beautiful book by Phil Stedman, which is still is called The Biological Analogy in Architecture, that looks more about the analogy. But I think that ultimately the, 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 the artificial world, which is the world we create, is created by us who follow the rules of... Uh, of natural evolution and follows also similar rules. Many people have written about it. One of the first treatises actually looking at uh, evolution in the artificial world is uh, by a guy called Butler, who wrote this text uh, 150 years ago called Darwin Amongst the Machines. So looking at, you know, uh, actually with some quite interesting and paradoxical thoughts also as well as machines use humans to reproduce themselves and, uh, and so on. But, but he uses basically uh, Darwin's uh, principles uh, and applies it to the artificial. Now, be, with, without going all the way to, um, to Butler, I think, you know, there's many, uh, many reasons, I believe, why some processes in what we deal with, all of us in this room deal with, follow something similar to, to the evolution in the natural world. Now, that is very different from saying that we are, you know, creating like a giant uh, uh, single humanity machine and connecting all of us together at the planetary level. It's a very different thing. So my, my, the way I was using the analogy and the biological analogy was more about you know, the process that we use in changing and transforming a city are not that different than some of the processes we see in nature. And, and many people have written about, about that. Now, in what you're saying, um, I, I think um, that actually uh, the fact of getting more connections globally could be one of the only escapes um, for humanity. And um, some of you know that um, when, um, at one point, uh, Albert Einstein was asked, you know, how will the Third World War be fought? And he replied, he said, you know, well, to be honest, I don't know about the third one, but I can tell you about the fourth one, it will be fought with sticks and stones. And so the point there is that, you know, we cannot really afford to have a fourth one. And uh, so how can, we, how can that happen, not to have more wars? 
um, apart from voting for a different U.S. president, but it's a, it's a different story. Uh, you know, how can that happen? Because we've seen it over th throughout the history of humanity. And uh, I think that the only hope we can have, and we can look at that more theoretically, there's probably not enough time now, but actually I, when I was at RMIT in, uh, in, the, in, the, was at, uh, in, in Melbourne, I was actually, uh, Jane uh, had a dinner where it was Peter Singer. Uh, Peter Singer is a great philosopher who wrote a book called The Expanding Circle. In The Expanding Circle is this idea that basically um, we are more and more aware of more people around ourselves. And, and that is a key principle, not to start a fight with that. And that's a key, that could be one of the key reasons also related to being more vegetarian. You know, 100 years ago, if you were vegetarian, you were really isolated. Today, most people, because just because you realize it's actually more and more circles, simplifying, the, the, the book is much more sophisticated, but you can simplify thinking about circles of empathy. And so I think the only way, we only, we, the only hope we have is actually if we use also the network in other ways in order to have more consciousness of the fact that we are all in this together, and so that, you know, that will help us not to have global conflicts anymore. So, I mean, not a big organism, but I think that direction of uh, feeling part, feeling on the same, back if we would say, spaceship Earth, uh, then feeling part of Spaceship Earth is probably the only hope we have. Thank to you. Maybe that's the right word to finish, right? Okay. Uh, I know, I, I'm happy to answer other questions, but... <laughs>